Kia ora everyone. Welcome to this Goodfellow Unit webinar on pelvic organ prolapse, a common problem, when to reassure and when to refer. This webinar is kindly supported by ACC and the Ministry of Health. My name is Dr. Helen Fulcher. I'm a GP and I'm your moderator for this webinar. Presenting tonight, we have three speakers. Dr. Nikki Dykes, a specialist urogynecologist at Te Whātuwara Waitemata. Dr. Sam Sam Lo, a consultant urologist at Te Whātuwara Waitemata. And Shelley Solomon, a pelvic health physiotherapist in Whangarei. As always, we will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can within the time allowed. Please place them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and we'll get through them with time allowed at the end of the uh, talk for question time. So I will let um, everyone take it away. Thank you, guys. So today we're talking about pelvic organ prolapse, uh, when to re reassure and when to refer. Um, the, this is the third of a series of three webinars that we have produced in conjunction with ACC and the Ministry of Health um, relating to um, prevention of mesh harm. This all really comes back to a, um, a report that was published by the Ministry of Health in December 2019, um, entitled Hearing and Responding to the Stories of Survivors of Surgical Mesh. Uh, this report presented the negative impacts of mesh on the lives of many New Zealanders and their whanau, and outlined a series of proposed actions to repair harm, ensure patient safety, and this included inter interdisciplinary education to prevent future harm. And as part of this, um, our working group has been working on developing an education package for primary healthcare providers. And um, this is the third of three webinars. So our first one was on managing mesh complications. Um, the second was on urinary incontinence. And this is our third one on um, prolapse. So with regards to pelvic organ prolapse, um, this is a really common finding in the female population. The problem is it's actually really difficult to estimate the true prevalence um, because every study that has been done um, will report prolapse differently and define it differently. So some studies will report purely anatomical findings, so what's found on examination. Some will report purely um, subjective findings, so what patients report, and then use different um, questions that they will ask the patient to define prolapse. Um, and so if you look at symptoms alone, it's maybe up to 30% of the population examination. So um, at least a stage two prolapse and stage two is roughly coming to around the hymen. Um, that's maybe up to 50%. Um, and if you look at a combination of two, it might be up to two thirds of women. Um, when you look at this graph on the right here, um, you can see this is a this is a paper where they looked at a thousand women presenting um, for an annual gynecological review. So between the ages of kind of 18 to 83 was their population. And these were women not presenting for a urogynecology problem or prolapse, but on examination when they examined them. If you look at this graph along the bottom here, we're going to talk a bit about the staging of prolapse. But in general, we're talking about the leading edge here. Um, the hymen is always our reference point. Um, and so if you can see the zero here, that's basically the hymen. If you look at um, minus three, this is no prolapse. Um, so it means that everything is sitting well up in the vagina. And if you look at the, the, top, um, the top line here, 25% of this population had no prolapse on examination. But between no prolapse and coming to the hymen, that encompassed a good 70 odd percent of that, of that group. And these are women not presenting, not being seen for, um, for a prolapse complaint. Um, this is another very good study, um, the Prolonged study, which was published in 2012. Um, and this does have a, um, uh, this has a bit more relevance to us because um, Dunedin was one of the centres um, where they performed the study. So it was a, an international longitudinal study um, looking at three centres, Birmingham, Aberdeen and Dunedin. And they looked at um, all the women who gave birth over a 12 month period. There were about 10,000 women. And then they followed these women up and invited them all to be part of this longitudinal study and about 7,000 women um, took part. Um, and when they got to 12 years, they sent them all a questionnaire and about 4,000 women responded and they managed to get about 20% of that study population, so around 700 women, to come back for a physical examination. And I think this is fairly telling. This looks at women who have all had pregnancies and deliveries. Um, if you look at this pie chart, um, stage zero, which is no prolapse at all anatomically, is in blue, and that's only 6% of this population. So everybody else, so 90, 94%, 93% actually had some degree of prolapse on physical examination. Now this doesn't relate to symptoms of prolapse. And unfortunately they used um, some kind of non-standardized questionnaires um, to, to try and work out um, symptoms of prolapse, but overall there were low rates of kind of subjective prolapse in this population. In saying that this was mostly premenopausal women, so younger than the age group who would traditionally seek treatment. 
Um, and another finding was that caesarean section is quite protective for findings of anatomical prolapse. And we'll kind of come back to that. So um, in terms of, it doesn't really make it easier for us to define, you know, what is prolapse. Um, I was part of a working group, um, an international group, where we came up with a clinical definition of prolapse for the International Urogyne Consultation, and we published this last year. And basically, after a literature review, we came up with a definition that's um, anatomical descent of the vaginal walls, the leading part, to or beyond the hymen, with the presence of bothersome symptoms. So those are the two things that we're really looking for. So someone who reports symptoms of prolapse, and we'll come on to what those are, but also they do have some anatomical descent. Um, we, we did also add in there patients who have a functional compromise due to prolapse without symptom bother. So that may be women who have a significant prolapse that aren't actually bothered by it, but it's actually putting, you know, it's um, causing urinary retention or um, causing hydronephrosis or, or renal impairment um, because of those kind of follow-on effects. So in terms of um, when we try and estimate kind of um, what's going on for these women, the peak incidence um, of developing symptoms seems to be in kind of between the ages of 70 to 79. We know that up to 20% of women may have surgery for prolapse during their lifetime. Um, but unfortunately, surgery isn't a kind of one-stop shop. It's not a, we fix everybody, they're done. We know that recurrent prolapse is really common and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and reoperation rates probably about 13% at five years, but it could possibly be up to 30% in some earlier studies. In terms of natural history, this is something that um, we quite commonly get asked. We see women who present with prolapse and they're not that bothered by it, but they're really worried that it's going to get worse if they don't do anything. Um, and a lot of natural kind of history studies um, have identified that mild to moderate prolapse is generally quite stable. So mild to moderate prolapse is probably kind of with it, still within the vagina or coming to the entrance of the vagina. But severe prolapse, so stage three or four, um, so well outside of the vagina, um, tends to progress. But some prolapse will actually regress with time. Um, so prolapse is a really dynamic finding as well. So, you know, examining someone at nine o'clock on a Monday morning, we may find something quite different to, to four o'clock on a Friday afternoon when they've been on their feet all week, really physically active. Things may have come down a lot more. So what we see on examination may not always be a true um, representation of what, what women are experiencing during the day. Um, when we look at, um, when we're talking about prolapse, what we tend to talk about is we tend to relate it to the part of the vagina that's affected. So we talk about the anterior compartment, so the front wall of the vagina, the posterior compartment, so the back wall of the vagina, and the apex. And so if we look at this picture on the left, this is a picture of a woman with normal anatomy, so no anatomical prolapse. Um, and you can see in here, we've got the, the vagina in here. Um, the bladder at the front, the rectum at the back. You have your pelvic floor muscles here, which are kind of wrapping around and providing support. Um, over on the right, you can see an anterior compartment prolapse. So this is the front wall of the vagina, which has been weakened and, and is, is stretched effectively. Um, and you can see that this is the front wall here. So it's coming down, it's coming to the entrance or just beyond the entrance of the vagina. And it's bringing the bladder with it because the bladder is sitting right behind. And this helps to partially explain why women may get some bladder symptoms, which we'll talk a little bit about. In terms of the back wall, um, again, you have a kind of a, a, a damage to the back wall of the vagina. And so you're getting this kind of stretching or elongation of the wall there, and it tends to bring the rectum with it. And uterine prolapse um, when the uterus is coming down because you've lost support up at the top of the vagina um, to the uterus and the surrounding vagina. And the uterus um, coming down will often come down with the bladder. Uh, so with the front wall and the back wall. And in fact, the front wall of the vagina and the uterus do often go together. So we'll often see, um, see both of these coming down, both compartments. So when we look at kind of the development of prolapse and risk factors, it's really multifactorial. Um, and we can kind of divide these into environmental factors and genetic factors. Um, the three that I've put asterisks next to in bold are actually the three kind of strongest determinants of prolapse development. So vaginal delivery is by far the strongest development, and it's um, almost exclusively vaginal delivery that plays a central role in the etiology of prolapse. Advancing age um, is also um, a significant um, uh, part of the etiology and genetic factors. So there are kind of three main things. But when you look at all the environmental factors, we know that pregnancy alone um, can be associated or as a risk factor for prolapse. Um, studies looking at women who have delivered by purely elective caesarean section have found that during pregnancy, these women will have some movement anatomically within the vagina in keeping with an element of prolapse. 
Um, and even after delivery, some studies have said, well, actually, things tend to go back. And other studies have said, well, actually, they have found still there's some degree of prolapse despite not giving birth vaginally. Um, and this probably relates to the pressure on the pelvic floor from the weight of the pregnancy and all the hormones that are that are in play as well. So progesterone, relaxin, um, the hormones that um, facilitate kind of pelvic floor relaxation and, and relaxation within the pelvis um, preparing for delivery. So with vaginal delivery, um, so with increasing parity, the more babies you have, the more likely you are to develop prolapse. Forceps delivery, unfortunately, forceps um, cause, can cause quite a bit of damage to the pelvic floor and levator ani muscle injury. And we'll kind of cover this a little bit. So the pelvic floor muscles are really providing this good support. And if you have damage to this with vaginal birth, then you're more likely to develop, to develop prolapse. Um, in terms of age, relative prevalence increases by 40% with each decade of life. Chronic increases in intra-abdominal pressure. So we know that women who have occupational heavy lifting are probably more likely um, to develop prolapse just with that repetitive strain on the pelvic floor. Um, and alongside this, obesity has been um, has been identified as a potential risk factor. Estrogen deficiency also, although the evidence is not quite so strong, but certainly anecdotally, we would see more women presenting postmenopausally. But again, that could also be a factor due to the age. Um, and hysterectomy, we know that um, up to 15% of women will need um, surgery for prolapse um, within 15 years of having a hysterectomy. Uh, with regards to genetic factors, there's a few things there, connective tissue deficiencies, genetic predisposition, ethnicity and family history. Um, and just as I've mentioned down there below, a caesarean section is actually strongly protective against development of anatomical prolapse, more so than subjective prolapse, but certainly prolapse. And um, so when we're looking and talking about the supports, you know, what's actually happening? Well, the reason you develop prolapse is you're developing either mechanical or neurovascular damage to the support um, to the vagina and the pelvic organs. And this picture on the left here um, is a picture um, where they've removed the uterus. You can see the cervix, the vagina, and this is the, um, the bladder neck here. And you can see these kind of sheets of connective tissue um, coming out to the side, connecting um, around here, out right to the pelvic side wall. Um, this picture on the on the right, um, these are what we kind of define Delancey's levels of support. And we talk about level one, two, and three. So level one, you have support to the uterus and or top of the vagina. So these are kind of the uterosacral ligaments, um, the cardinal ligaments providing support to the apical component. Level two, it's coming out to the side. So it's the, the tissue kind of between the bladder and the vagina and then the rectum and the vagina coming out laterally to the pelvic side wall for support. And level three is the perineal body. So um, that's at the perineum. So really the, the muscle body kind of between the, the vagina and the anus. Um, and just coming back to the levator ani muscles, just, um, and I think Shelley's going to talk a little bit about this as well when she's talking about pelvic floor muscle training. We have these, um, these this like, it's like a bowl almost really of, of muscles that are providing a lot of support. Um, and they're really important um, in terms of protecting against um, prolapse. This picture over on the right, um, this is just trying to show what some of the damage can happen with vaginal birth. If we look at A, looking at this kind of this loop of muscle here, this is a puborectalis muscle. So it's coming from the symphysis pubis anteriorly. Oh, sorry. Um, it's looping down around the vagina, around the rectum and back up again. Um, and this is the, what we talk about when we're talking about levator avulsion. This is the particular muscle that we're looking at. If you look at the picture down here um, in D, you can see that on this side, there is, um, oh, I don't know if you can see my arrow. On this side, you can see that there is an intact muscle, whereas on the other side, it's actually come away from the bone and that's levator avulsion. And that side, that's something we cannot fix surgically. Once that damage is done, it's done, but it means that you're really losing a lot of the support. Um, and I think this ship and dock analogy is quite a good way of trying to understand it. If you think of the kind of pelvic and abdominal organs as being a boat, um, so this one here, and you've got the water here, and that's like the pelvic, the pelvic floor muscles, and that's providing that support. You've got these ligaments, which are the cables holding the, the boat up to the, to the dock, and they're like the ligaments that are holding all the pelvic organs in place. Once you lose that water, um, and that water is taken away, you're losing that, that support underneath the boat, which means all the strain is coming on these cables. So all that strain is, is coming on those ligaments. And with time, you'll just get continual pressure and damage on there, and sometimes it, it may be okay for a while, and then just with repeated, repeated kind of um, heavy lifting, that's just going to cause further damage on on somewhere where there's just no support currently. So that can be quite a useful way of kind of thinking about what's happening with prolapse development. When we come to thinking as history of patient with prolapse, it's quite important to 
find out if they have a bulge, whether it is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, some patients would report that uh, they've, they're wiping themselves and they've felt there's something in there, but actually it's not giving them any symptoms. So that's quite important to establish if there's something they are, they are, they are feeling um, or there's something that actually is, is symptomatic all the time. Now, then we focus on um, uh, three major areas of symptoms. One's the bladder, the vagina, and the bowel. And I'll go into more detail in the next few slides. And also important to establish if patient has any pain. Now, generally speaking, um, prolapse doesn't give pain, but um, patient that has significant, uh, say, low back pain or pelvic pain, general pain, it's quite important to establish if their pain is related to their uh, prolapse or not, because that will give us, we'll talk a little bit more in the next few slides about pain, um, because it does, um, it is an important factor when we decide if we will operate on these patients in a certain way. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the details about the risk factors because Nikki has gone through about the etiology and the risk factors for prolapse. So it's quite good to um, screen those and you can put them in your referral to us. Um, and uh, another important aspect is uh, there's a lot of anxiety these days around um, mesh use um, for prolapse or for incontinence. And sometimes patients can get the two conditions mixed up. If they have had a mesh sling, for instance, they would sometimes think that they've had it for prolapse. Or on the other hand, they may have a vaginal um, uh, mesh put in and they thought that was for the incontinence. So if they've had mesh use in their pelvis, uh, even if, if they had it for rectal prolapse, um, it's good to uh, write them down your referral. And also sometimes patients may not have any mesh and they thought they have. Um, or they may have a native tissue repair and they may suffer from complications from that. So it is quite good to identify what previous operations were and if uh, mesh has been used or not. Now, um, these are the red flags condition that I think um, we should go through. They should have an early referral to us. Um, so patients that has a post bleed. Uh, postmenopausal bleed or hematuria. So generally speaking, patients that has prolapse don't normally present with those symptoms. They may have prolapse with these conditions, but um, these patients will need to be seen sooner. And then for patients that have had previous mesh uh, repair, um, if you think that they may, they may be suffering from complications like uh, having pain from mesh, or um, they may have erosions, uh, exposure, um, they, need, they should be uh, referred on a bit sooner. Now, Nikki has talked about um, advanced prolapse, patients that has, uh, say, a stage four or procedentia, a complete eversion of the uterus causing urinary retention, for instance, or they have bilateral hydronephrosis giving rise to acute kidney injury. They should also be referred early. Now, some patients have quite advanced prolapse, like the picture that we've got there on the bottom. Um, they may come with quite um, bad skin excoriation from that. Um, these patients, again, should be seen sooner rather than later. Um, and then since we're talking a lot about um, uh, complications or pain issues, so if you get patients that has uh, new pain or persistent pain following prolapse surgery and, um, and has not been uh, managed accordingly in, uh, by the specialist in the hospital and they've subsequently been discharged to your care, for instance, I think they should certainly be referred back to the surgeon because we all want to know when our patients are not doing well. And if you feel like um, uh, you need a second opinion uh, for the new pain that the patient has developed, feel free to do so. Now, as we focus on bladder symptoms or lower urinary tract symptoms, now, um, as you can see in the picture that Nikki has already shown you, um, generally speaking, they are more associated with uh, of the front wall prolapse or some people call it the sister seal or the bladder prolapse. Um, but they're not always that way. You may have someone that has got, say, a uterine prolapse and have a significant bladder issue. So when you come to taking history from their bladder point of view, generally patients will report that they find it difficult to empty. Um, they feel like they have, to, uh, they have to wait and they have to lean forward. And after they've emptied, they feel like they haven't really emptied completely. And these are quite common. Uh, some patients would have to splint. They have to um, put their finger in their, in their vagina to give it some support to try and reduce the prolapse to empty their bladder. Uh, and often patients would report overactive bladder, uh, urinary frequency and urgency. Now, this could, 30% um, of the time, could be associated with their prolapse, but um, or a patient could have an isolated bladder issue that, um, that has, that is, you know, 
it's got nothing to do with their prolapse, but often the patient would have these symptoms. Now, with regards to incontinence and prolapse, now up to 20 to 40% of patients will have both of these conditions. So if they have both, uh, it's quite good to get a bit more history around the incontinence, whether they have whether they have urge or whether they have, they have stress or whether they have a mixed incontinence. Um, if you see the diagram there on the right, if you can see that when um, when the bladder is uh, uh, when you've got anterior vaginal prolapse, so the bladder sort of flopping backwards, you can see that the urethra sometimes gets blocked by the bulge. So if you ask this question, sometimes you get this his interesting history about patient having stress incontinence, and then that somehow has improved when their prolapse got worse, and that's because of the um, pressure effect of the bladder blocking of the urethra. So patients that has got prolapse and, and, and incontinence, um, both needs to be addressed. Sometimes we can do concurrent surgery so that we uh, can treat both problems at the same time. Now patients often could uh, present to you with uh, problems with recurrent UTI and you do an examination and you find that, oh, they've got a big prolapse and whether or not uh, the prolapse is causing um, a high PBR when they're not emptying their bladder properly. And that you know, 10 to 20% of the time could be associated with recurrent UTIs, but not always. Now, what about sexual and vaginal symptoms? Um, often patient will say to you, there will be their presenting complaint. They'll say to you, I feel like there's a bulge coming uh, down below, or they may say something, it feels like something's falling out, or I get this heavy sensation, this dragging feeling, especially at, uh, as, uh, as um, the day progresses. Now, some patients said, oh, I feel like I'm sitting on a ball. Um, these are very common. Now, um, as for sexual symptoms, sometimes patients don't volunteer these um, um, complaints. So it's quite important to ask specifically, ask them if they uh, are avoiding sexual intercourse because of um, the obstructive symptoms with uh, the, the prolapse is causing them, or they have um, they are, they're embarrassed by it. They feel like they're not attractive when they have got a big prolapse coming down. So it, it's important that there is a psychosexual aspect of this and they often don't volunteer um, this history if you don't ask them specifically. Now, some patients also worry about this when they have, um, that they're worried about um, say, uh, urinary urgency, whether they will have a bit of coital in, um, incontinence, a bit of leakage, both um, from the bladder or the, or, or the anal end when they have intercourse. So it's quite important to ask this because if they have these symptoms, they are significant. They are significant. So it's important to put this in your history uh, when you, if you do refer to us because we, we do want to know about these details. When it comes to bowel symptoms, um, as you can see, uh, Nikki has shown me that same picture before. Um, Often um, you can ask patients if they do they feel like they're emptying their bowels completely. They often will say to you, "Look, uh, I feel like um, I, I could empty uh, uh, my bowel, but often um, I'm, I'm there wiping myself for so long because there's always something left behind, or they feel like they have to strain, or some patients even have to uh, digitate. They put their finger to spin to get to to get the last bit out." Um, these are common symptoms. And um, some patients also report um, incontinence from the, from the anal end. So they might find that they, they leak um, not just solid stool, but liquid or gas. Um, patients often um, also has uh, storage issues. They get fecal urgency with this. They feel like they have to go. When they have to go, they have to go. Um, they, and they, they lose a lot of confidence, um, especially being out, about, out and about when they have this um, sensation. Now, um, does pain, um, does, does prolapse cause pain? Now, um, I often say to my patients, prolapse doesn't, doesn't actually give them pain per se, but, um, but often if you ask them more specifically, patients do report um, having low back pain. And um, for people who has got prolapse, they are more, twice more likely to have low back pain compared to people who doesn't actually have prolapse. So, uh, the symptoms may uh, improve when the prolapse gets reduced or they may not. Um, and with regards to pelvic pain, again, um, uh, the pelvic organ prolapse group seem to have more pelvic pain, um, whether this is, this is probably more associated um, um, uh, with prolapse rather than actually caused by the prolapse. Uh, when we compare that to groups that does not have pelvic organ prolapse. Now, some patients also have generalized quite um, uh, sort of uh, 
lower pelvic pain or abdominal pain that will, you know, it's very difficult to establish the, the, the causality between oral pelvic organ prolapse and pain. Now, since it's difficult to establish, why is it important? Um, it is important, especially, say for instance, if you're going to um, put a pessary in, if you're one of, the, uh, one of the BPs that've been trained to do that, it is quite good to establish if they've got pain before we put a pessary in, but more so for us, um, it is also it is important before we make decisions about what would be the most suitable surgery for them. Patient that has chronic pelvic pain, we do try to avoid um, mesh material. Uh, otherwise, it gets very tricky if they have pain post-op, whether this is related to mesh or not. Um, even with sacral spinal fixation, it has got to 6% risk of causing pain in the buttock. So for us, um, we certainly want to know if patient has any uh, pre-existing pain issues. Examination, uh, for those of us that have been in our webinar in, you know, incontinence, I think you'll remember this picture that Nikki has put on a slide um, and I've just put it on here as well. Uh, we normally examine, I normally examine patient supine um, with frog leg position as well as standing up. Um, so what do I look for? I look for the skin changes to see if patient has atrophic vaginitis. I look for any scars, any previous um, uh, obstetric scars from general delivery. Um, I look at previous pelp uh, prolapse repair, if they've got um, uh, repair in the past. And um, you look at any obvious prolapse at rest. Um, and I, uh, we always check there whether they've got a associated um, stress incontinence by getting them to cough to see if there's any urethral hypermobility or whether there's any positive cough test so that we could um, address both prolapse and incontinence issues at the same time. Then we do a bimenu exam to look for pelvic masses. Now, with regards to uh, looking at the, uh, the compartments, um, which compartment is causing, or is actually um, uh, the, major, the prolapse, we, are off, we do um, split the speculum, uh, use the posterior blade and get patient to Valsalva for six seconds to look at the maximal extent. So again, what Nikia said before, um, it is important to note the, the leading edge, the, the lowest edge of the prolapse in relation to the hymen. So when Nikki was showing you the graph about minus three to zero and plus three, it actually is in centimeters. So you can just, we just want to know the measurement. So if you tell us say um, the leading edge of the prolapse is uh, two centimeters below the hymen, that is hugely useful when we uh, grade your referral. Um, when we split the speculum, we then, we are showing the next slide, how we examine, we usually, we usually, um, yeah, thank you, thank you for that, Nikki. So if you want to look at the anterior wall, um, you put your speculum on the posterior wall and get the patient to strain. Um, it's often that patient finds it difficult to understand straining or pushing. Um, if you find that difficult, get them to cough and try and see the, the lowest end of the prolapse to see how far it is lower down in relation to the hymen. So the first picture showed not a severe prolapse, but that's the front wall of the, of the vagina coming down. And in the posterior wall, um, again, you can um, put your um, split speculum in the front wall of the, of the uh, vagina and get patients to strain or cough um, to look at the posterior wall coming down. And this, um, uh, this examination is, is uh, you do a rectal exam at the same time to see the weakness in the um, posterior wall. To establish the apical prolapse, um, you put the speculum in and as you get the patient to strain and push, you sort of slowly withdraw that uh, speculum to see the, the, the extent of the descent um, of the cervix or the vaginal vault. Now, this is a slide on the staging. So I don't want to go into too much details, but basically when you see a letter from us, when we talk about the POP-Q, we give you different measurements of um, the, the prolapse. It's, it's really more hugely beneficial for us um, who are operating on the patient so that we remember um, which were, you know, the, the measurement that we were doing during the exam, but we don't expect that you'll be giving us all these numbers. So if you look at, you just focus on the um, top uh, 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 diagram. If you look at, you can use either the Baden Walker system or the POPQ. The more important thing is to really writing down uh, in centimeters, the, 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 the distal end of the prolapse in relation to the hymen. So you can say it is one centimeter from the hymen. Above the hymen, you can write it as minus one, or if it's um, below the hymen by a centimeter, you, just, you rewrite it as plus one, okay? Now, uh, what about the principles of treatment for primary care? So, like I say, the most importantly is to try and establish if their patients has got uh, 
uh, symptoms. So if they've got no symptoms or this is very mild, then the principles are really trying to maximize pelvic floor function. So you encourage them to do pelvic floor exercise. And we know that if they do see a pelvic floor physio or a continence and a specialist, they do have better outcome. Um, and then is to improve um, the, estrogen, uh, the estrogen levels in the vagina by giving them ovestin cream. And uh, preventing progression will be to uh, focus on lifestyle changes, um, which uh, Shelley will go into detail for us. So for this group of patients, you want to reassure them. Um, now, uh, I've gone through the red flags before, and in these conditions, you want to refer them to uh, specialists um, early. Over to you, Shelley. Thank you, Samsam. Yes, look, with regards to conservative management for, um, for prolapse, so this is suitable for those women with a lesser degree of prolapse, uh, possibly those women that are, are haven't, their families aren't completed yet, they're planning to have further children, um, those that are frail or unable to have surgery, and then those that are unwilling or, or don't want to undergo surgery. And so the aims of conservative treatment really is to prevent that prolapse from becoming worse and to decrease the frequency and severity of the symptoms um, caused by the prolapse and then also uh, to avoid or delay the need for surgery. So the options we have under conservative management are lifestyle modifications, pelvic floor muscle training and pessary. So I'm just going to talk about the first two. Um, lifestyle modifications, the aim here is to, like we said, is to reduce that downward pressure on the organs and minimise or eliminate any prolapse symptoms and prevent that prolapse from worsening. So um, one of the most important ones, uh, constipation is associated with both prolapse symptoms and having prolapse surgery, and it's a risk factor for pelvic floor dysfunction um, due to that straining involved. So managing um, or preventing constipation really is, is vital in these women. Um, sometimes, like uh, some, some, um, and Nikki was saying, they can have some difficulty with emptying their bladder and bowels, depending on where their prolapse, uh, what is prolapsing or where their prolapse is. So giving advice around positioning on the toilet to ensure optimal emptying can be really helpful um, for both bladder and bowels. Um, and just a couple of examples, uh, feet up on footstools or a twin pack of toilet rolls, um, you know, one under each foot can be really helpful for emptying your bowels. Uh, leaning right forward or double voiding, which is where you, you know, sit down and empty, then stand up, move about, then sit down and try again. Um, they can be really helpful tips for bladder emptying if, if a woman are having trouble voiding. Um, splinting is also something um, that can be really helpful. Now, depending on where the defect is, this could be either a thumb and vaginally and pressing down, or it could be pressure on the perineum, or very occasionally it can be sort of transanally or one side of the anus. Um, this can improve or correct that prolapse defect and assist with bowel emptying. Um, now, patients have often figured this out for themselves. Um, but they often don't volunteer that they're doing it. Um, so telling them that this is okay is, is often helpful. Um, we don't recommend digitation, which is where they put a finger in anally and um, try and get the stool out that way, try and hook it out. So we don't recommend that, but splinting is definitely helpful for some women, uh, especially those with that posterior compartment um, prolapse. Uh, the relationship between prolapse and body weight is conflicting in the literature, but there is some evidence that reduction of BMI can improve prolapse symptoms um, and that being overweight does increase the risk of worsening prolapse with time. So this is definitely worth discussing for these women. Um, as is managing any respiratory conditions, uh, especially trying to minimise repetitive coughing, so, uh, you know, your effective clearing techniques, appropriate and effective medication, and, and like I said, managing their cough is, is vital. Regarding intercourse, um, as um, sometimes mentioned is, uh, earlier, just often, you know, reassuring them that being intimate will not damage anything is really helpful. Um, and possibly giving advice regarding positioning, um, for example, putting pillows under their pelvis, et cetera, if they experience any discomfort. Um, 
the eye nut is something that some women with prolapse find helpful, and I've just put a picture of it there. It's basically sort of four stacking rings um, that their partner wears that, depending on, um, it reduces the depth of penetration. Um, and these are available here in New Zealand quite easily, so that's a nice option for some women. Okay, um, pelvic floor muscle training. So, Research here has shown that women with prolapse do have pelvic floor muscle impairment, and they're also three times more likely to have damage to their pelvic floor muscles compared to women without prolapse. Now, there's two main mechanisms for how pelvic floor muscle training can be effective for prolapse, and I think hopefully this slide here will answer one of the questions I see about um, relating to Nikki's slide about how you get the water back in the dock um, under the ship. So the two mechanisms, the first one, learning to consciously contract the pelvic floor muscles before and during increases in intra-abdominal pressure. This is um, commonly known as the NAC in pelvic health uh, physiotherapy circles, um, and or sometimes called bracing. And they learn to do this um, continually with these increases in intra-abdominal pressure, like with coughing or sneezing or laughing, uh, lifting. Um, and it's a behaviour modification that prevents that descent of the pelvic floor and sort of helps counteract uh, any increase in intra-abdominal pressure. And then the other mechanism for how pelvic floor muscle training can be effective for prolapse is that regular strength training improves that firmness and structural support of the pelvic floor, so giving more support to those, um, to those organs. Um, Pelvic floor muscle training is a very successful conservative option for the treatment of women with prolapse, and it should be offered as first-line treatment. Um, we have really good evidence from randomised controlled trials that, that pelvic floor muscle training is effective um, in reducing prolapse symptoms and or improving the prolapse stage by one stage in women with um, stage one, two, or three prolapse. Um, like we mentioned in the previous webinar in, uh, on incontinence, the same applies for prolapse um, and pelvic floor muscle training. To get the best results, and the research is really clear on this, pelvic floor muscle training needs to be taught and supervised, preferably by a pelvic health physiotherapist or a continence nurse specialist with skills um, in this area. The correct technique and having awareness and being able to isolate the correct muscles is vital. Um, using imagery and various cues is helpful. Um, for example, squeeze the anus, squeeze the back passage. Imagine you're stopping the flow of urine or trying to prevent wind escaping. Uh, it's really important that the right muscles are targeted and there is minimal accessory muscle use or movement. Um, as far as timeframes go, um, the NICE guidelines recommend supervised pelvic floor muscle training for at least 16 weeks. I often say to my patients, it's three to six weeks of doing it to notice a difference, but it's three to six months to get to full strength. Um, and it doesn't need to be every day for the rest of your life. Um, pelvic floor muscles are skeletal muscles, and they can be trained in the same way as other skeletal muscles. So once they're strong, you're, you're on a maintenance program. You do have to do exercises, but, but not every single day. Um, compliance and adherence are common downfalls of pelvic floor muscle training. Um, however, referring to a physio or continence nurse specialist early uh, will help hugely. We've also got various apps, squeezies, a nice one from the NHS in the UK, um, and different biofeedback equipment out there. FemFit, which is a, a New Zealand device, uh, PeriFit, PeriCoach. Um, sometimes balls and weights, which can be, you know, they can be used for women with mild prolapse, um, and they do work really well for the right person. Uh, with any of these sort of things, I'd suggest contacting your nearest pelvic uh, health physio for advice and guidance on this if you or a patient are interested in learning more and finding out what's best for them. So I, I strongly encourage you to either refer your patients or encourage them to visit a pelvic health physio or clinical nurse. Uh, continence nurse specialist, sorry, with skills in this area. Uh, pelvic floor muscle training uh, really does work for prolapse. It's effective and safe, but it needs thorough instruction and supervision uh, to be effective. And the earlier these women are referred, the better. Um, and look, just a little bit on um, healthy exercise and prolapse. Um, 
And this is often a question that a lot of women ask us. Um, and we all know that exercise is vital for our overall health. But having prolapse can cause women to decrease their physical activity, which can be counterproductive, you know, increasing their BMI, worsening of prolapse symptoms, etc. Um, there's no blanket rule for exercise in women with prolapse, but to keep it really simple, exercise, no matter what they choose to do, should not cause or worsen any symptoms. Not only their prolapse symptoms of heaviness and bulge, um, but also any bladder or bowel symptoms, any leakage, anything like that. Um, if it does, they need to stop that exercise um, and amend it. Um, exercise should also be gradual and monitored if possible. Um, pelvic health physios are great here. Um, we also have a lot of personal trainers um, in this area as well that, can, um, that have been trained in and this sort of prescribing exercise for these women. So um, it really does pay to ask around and find out, you know, who is in your area. Um, individual assessment really is needed for each woman. Um, and we need to decide really between what is high risk and low risk exercise for that patient. So correct technique with their exercise is vital. Um, incorporating use of the neck or that bracing that I mentioned earlier, depending on the type of exercise. And really trying to minimise that increase in intra-abdominal pressure is, is really important. Uh, pessaries, which I think um, Nikki's going to come to in a minute, are also very useful for women with prolapse who want to exercise. And a pessary can support the prolapse and minimise symptoms, which means the woman can exercise, you know, um, improve her BMI and, and hopefully improve her prolapse symptoms. So, like I've said, it's not possible to be prescriptive with exercise for women with prolapse as a whole. However, there are some activities that women with prolapse need to be careful with, and prior to participating, we'd strongly recommend review with a pelvic health physio. Um, things like caution with repetitive heavy lifting, caution with some exercises like wide-legged squats or lunges, especially if they're adding in um, a weight as, as well. Uh, Caution with jumping exercises, you know, star jumps, box jumps, burpees, that sort of thing. And exercise where they, and again, it comes down to technique often, where they're breath holding. Um, so, you know, their technique, correct technique is, is essential. Um, I know I'm a little bit biased here, but review with a pelvic health physio is really beneficial for these women. Um, we, you know, not only assess what's going on in their pelvic floor, um, but look at their degree of prolapse along with their abdominal wall function, their breathing function, um, what exercise they're wanting to do. Um, and when looking at all this, it means we can be really specific with them about what is high risk and low risk exercise for that patient and then guide them with individual and specific exercise advice. Uh, yeah, all women with prolapse symptoms, no matter what stage, um, would benefit from physiotherapy review here. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks, Shelley. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about vaginal pessaries because these can be a really effective and safe way of managing prolapse symptoms. So the picture on the left just shows the four kind of most common types of pessaries that we use. The ring pessary is by far the most common pessary that we use in practice. Um, this one does not have a support. Some of them have kind of a, a membrane covering that hole, if you like, with some drainage holes, um, which we would call kind of a ring pessary with support. Um, and the picture on the right just shows how a pessary might sit in the vagina. And so basically it's just helping to straighten up the, the walls of the vagina to lift everything up inside. They don't always sit perfectly like that, but to be honest, it doesn't matter how they sit so long as they're working. So so long as a woman is comfortable um, and it's not falling out and their bladder and bowel function is fine, it doesn't really matter exactly how they're sitting internally. Um, in terms of fitting them, um, it's very much trial and error so they don't work for everybody and I'm always very clear when I say that to women that I might put it in they'll be great they go home it falls out you know they come back we might need to try a different size or a different shape um, but sometimes the anatomy is such that we just can't get one to sit for example someone who has had maybe a previous hysterectomy and may have a narrowed apex at the top of the vagina but has had quite significant um, pelvic floor muscle damage and has a really wide opening to the vagina it's going to be a bit tricky to get something to fit in there um, because that's how we kind of work out what size to place. We, we look at how wide the vagina is um, at the apex and take into consideration the hiatus at the entrance. 
We usually start with a ring pessary, uh, unless it's a very large prosthodenture or they've got a very large genital hiatus, in which case a Gellhorn pessary, that middle one, um, may be more useful. So it's more what we call kind of a space occupying um, pessary rather than being a supportive one. Uh, any woman who is postmenopausal um, should use estrogen vaginal cream twice a week, preferably, to help to prevent infection or ulceration or erosions. Um, and in reality, sometimes women find that the, the applicator is really fiddly. It's, it's the same kind of applicator that women use for kind of thrush um, creams. And so just telling women that they can just put a little bit on their finger, kind of the size of a pea, and if they feel comfortable, just popping their finger in the vagina as far as they can reach up around the pessary if they can and just rub it around twice a week at night that can sometimes be more effective because often they're not sure where they're going with the applicator when there's a pessary in place we would normally review patients kind of four to six weeks after placing a pessary and then every four to six months a removal and reciting of pessary um, but it's also quite good if women can self-manage the, the pessaries themselves for ongoing maintenance and then we may not need to keep seeing them in clinic um, and so often at that kind of four to six week appointment if things are going well and if the woman wants to learn that's when I would kind of teach her how to how to manage that herself um sexual activity is possible with the ring pessary not always but sometimes some women find that it's completely fine um, and they don't have any problems whereas other women find it really gets in the way and that's just because it, it we use different sizes and and sometimes it, it can be coming down quite low in the vagina to provide support so it really just obstructs um penetrative intercourse so pessaries um, can be very good, um, you know, for patients, um, particularly elderly patients who don't want surgery, provided they're happy to keep coming and seeing us um, for regular appointments or are happy to manage it themselves. But it's also very good for young women who have not completed their family. Um, and sometimes the cube pessary, which is the bottom pessary down in the bottom there, um, that can be quite useful for these women. The cube pessary is, um, it's again, what we call a space occupying pessary. So it kind of works by sitting in the vagina and almost working on suction um, to hold it in place against the vaginal walls. The only issue with this pessary is it really needs to be removed every day. So it's not good for your 85 year old woman um, who might not have great dexterity, but it is good for you know a 28 year old woman. Um, and it may be only the, the young woman only needs it when she's doing exercise, as Shelley said. Um, and so being able to put that in and out herself can be very useful. Overall pessaries aren't so effective for the posterior compartment because that back wall does tend to just kind of come down in front of the pessary, but it can, it can work. So we would often still try it in that setting. Um, this is just briefly, I won't go into too much detail. Um, we did a study when I was on my fellowship in Melbourne, we've just submitted this for publication, but we did a retrospective review looking at all women who came to our tertiary urogyne service um, who were 75 years or older with their first presentation of prolapse. And so we looked at two, almost 220 women over a 12 year period and what we found was that although 78% of these older women opted for an initial pessary management, and we were able to successfully fit them in about 84% of women, over time, actually two thirds of these women ended up having surgery. Um, and the mean time to surgery was about 21 months. And when you look at kind of the, um, the survival curve, um, the median time of kind of pessary survival or how long it would stay in was about a year. And um, we also found quite high rates of complications with this age group. Um, so high rates of vaginal discharge, bleeding, erosions, pessary expulsion, pain. Um, and some risk factors for pessary failure were kind of a younger age. A previous hysterectomy or prolapse surgery was quite a strong association, but also increasing parity. But one thing that was quite useful is that we found that there was no difference in kind of perioperative complications or long-term surgical outcomes between those who opted for surgery straight away and didn't want the pessary and those who had a pessary found it didn't work for them and then went on to have surgery. So despite the, the time difference um, and the, the kind of age difference, um, actually the outcomes were basically the same. Um, we weren't powered to look closely at these associations, but that was quite, quite reassuring um, because often we have women who come in and they say, oh, well, if I don't have surgery now, you know, in five years time, I'm not going to be in any shape to have surgery. Um, and that's not always quite, quite the case. So with regards to surgery, um, we really are mostly looking at performing surgery or offering surgery to women who have tried and have been unsuccessful with conservative measures um, and who ha are having really significant effect on their quality of life. Um, and we need to have quite an intense discussion with them about whether the benefits of surgery are going to outweigh any potential risks of surgery for them. 
Um, and it's really all about the kind of the right surgery for the right patient at the right time. So what we would be offering a woman who's maybe in her 40s, who's got a significant prolapse um, and maybe heavy periods um, and has finished her family is going to be quite different to someone who's in their 60s with a kind of mild to moderate prolapse, but maybe quite a lot of bowel symptoms, um, which is again going to be quite different to someone who's 90 um, and really is just sick of this lump between her legs and, um, and wants it managed. Um, so there's all these things that we kind of need to think about. Um, this flow diagram on the left is um, from the International Consultation on Incontinence, um, and it's a surgical treatment pathway that they've kind of come up with. But basically, it looks at all the, these are all the different things that we kind of need to be thinking about um, when we're thinking about surgical procedures, and they've come up with what their preferred options are and what other possible pathways are. Um, essentially, what we are trying to decide when we see a woman and we're talking about surgery is, are we going to do a reconstructive procedure, which basically means they're going to have a functional vagina so they can have intercourse, or are we looking at doing an obliterative procedure, so actually closing the vagina? So again, we're not going to be talking about obliterative procedures in a 40-year-old woman, but in a 90-year-old woman, we would be. Um, with regards to apical support, um, we, uh, if they have descent of the uterus or of the top of the vagina, if they've had a previous hysterectomy, um, then we need to be working out what kind of support we're going to be placing there. So if they have a uterus, are we going to take out the uterus, do a hysterectomy as part of the prolapse operation, or are we going to keep the uterus as a uterine conserving procedure? There are pros and cons to both approaches. Long term, the outcomes um, in terms of prolapse recurrence is basically the same, whether we do a hysterectomy or keep the uterus and work around it. Um, but, you know, for someone who has risk factors, say, for endometrial malignancy, so maybe very overweight or um, maybe they've had abnormal smears um, and might be at risk, you know, needing ongoing colposcopies, then maybe a hysterectomy is going to be better for that woman. Um, someone who wants the least invasive surgery, low risk um, for endometrial malignancy, maybe has a normal scan or a normal biopsy, that, that might be quite a good option for them to keep the uterus and we would just work around it. And then we're kind of looking at, are we going to do what we what we refer to as a native tissue repair, which is really just reinforcing the patient's own tissues with dissolvable stitches? Or are we going to look at putting a more permanent, um, a, something more permanent in there, such as mesh or a graft of some description? And usually, not always, but usually this comes down to, are we going to do a vaginal operation? So all through the vagina, which we typically just do native tissue, so no mesh. Or are we looking at doing an abdominal procedure, um, which is likely to involve mesh? And in general, um, we'd often be looking at doing a vaginal operation for first repair, or if the uterus is present, and we're more likely to be considering an abdominal repair using mesh for recurrent prolapse, or if they've had a previous hysterectomy. These aren't kind of blanket rules. Um, there are lots of other things that we take into consideration, but that's kind of, these are the sorts of things that we're thinking about when we're deciding what kind of surgery to offer. So when we talk about reconstructive surgery, as I said, we're basically maintaining a functional vagina. The picture on the left is what we refer to in terms of vaginal and native tissue repair. Um, so no mesh is being placed. We're using stitches. We Most of us would use fully dissolvable stitches. Um, and this picture here just shows um, something called a sacrospinous fixation, where we're putting some stitches up the top of the vagina or from the cervix. And we're lifting it up retroperitoneally to the sacrospinous ligament. And we do this on one side, usually on the patient's right side. Um, that's why sometimes women will have quite bad buttock pain in their on the right side after surgery. Um, it feels like someone's kicked them in the bum. Um, and that's quite a common finding after this kind of surgery. Um, that does it does go away, but if it's persistent and you have a woman with persistent pain, please send them back to see us. Um, conversely, this um, procedure on the right here, the, this is a, showing a mesh sacrocopexy, so attaching mesh um, to the sacral promontory um, and then attaching it to the front and back walls of the vagina. Um, I will mention obliterative surgery. So this is an operation called a copoclasis. This picture here, this is a woman with a prosthodenture, and you can see this is huge. It's like a football between her legs. And this woman is highly likely to have terrible problems with her bladder. She may well not be able to avoid um, and this needs to be managed. A colpoclasis is an operation where we basically, um, it's like you've got, if you think of the vagina as like a sock and it's kind of turned inside out, what we're doing is we're turning it back the right way and then stitching it closed. So we're attaching the front and the back walls of the vagina together um, and effectively closing the vagina. So it's a great operation. It's a really satisfying operation. It's, it's um, low morbidity, so it's quite a low risk procedure. Um, with a high success rate. So the failure rate's only in the order of maybe 5%. 
Um, it's great for advanced prolapse in older women. They just need to know that this does preclude further sexual activity. Um, and very low reg regret rates are reported in the literature from this operation. So this is an excellent operation um, for women. And women often, like the day after surgery, you see them, they're pain-free, they go home, and they do really, really well. Um, and we can do this in, you know, we can do this under kind of a spinal or an epidural. It's been reported being done under local anesthetic. I don't think you could feasibly do that for a prolapse this big. Um, but um, certainly, even if they're high risk for anesthetics, often we can still manage to do this kind of operation. Samson? Thank you, Nikki. So I'm just going to talk about recurrent prolapse. So Nikki has mentioned about um, a little bit about the recurrence rate. So in general, um, uh, when you see someone that has had previous prolapse repair, you want to sort of... Um, look at them whether they have a simple recurrence or whether they're, they're complex. So simple recurrence, um, you see them in um, patients that has previous vaginal repair uh, up to between 10 to 30 percent. And um, for patients that has had abdominal cyclical apexy, there's about a 10 percent recurrence rate as well. Now, the principles of management of a simple recurrence um, is is almost exactly the same as uh, of a someone who's presenting for the first time. So you want to know if they're symptomatic uh, with their bulge, and then you want to assess their bladder bowel vaginal symptoms like what I've gone through before. And generally speaking, if they have no, uh, no symptoms or mild um, symptoms, again, um, ovastin cream, and you can send them for, for physiotherapy. Now, for those that are of you that can put pessaries, uh, in again, this can be offered. Now, if they are quite symptomatic and uh, or they have failed for physio, and they would like to, um, uh, assessment by us to see if they, they could uh, have another surgery, then they get referred to us. And again, we assess them exactly like how we would assess uh, a primary patient. And depending on again which compartments have uh, recurred. Um, we decide whether they have a, uh, a vaginal approach or, or a sickle corporal pixie. Um, now, if they, if they have previously had a mesh, for instance, uh, then they become a, a complex recurrence. So when I mentioned mesh, they could have uh, a vaginal mesh, which we're no longer putting in, um, or they could have a previous sickle corporal pixie mesh. Um, uh, or they may have uh, a rectal pixie mesh that was placed for rectal prolapse done by the colorectal surgeons. So if they have mesh uh, surgery in the past or they have uh, mesh removal surgery in the past, um, then they are complex. Um, if they have uh, complex uh, pelvic pain or vaginal pain, uh, again, we'll classify them as uh, more complex. And some of these patients uh, may have had previous um, other pelvic surgery, um, whether mesh related or non mesh related, they may have quite poor bladder function. Um, they may have intractable juice overactivity, for instance. They have significant uh, poor, com poorly compliant bladder. They can't store very much, or they have got an atonic bladder from um, nerve damage from their previous pelvic surgery, or they have had radiation. Um, they may have had their bladder taken out for cancer, or they may have their, uh, done an abdominal perineal resection for cancer. So these patients are complex. If they've got a, a prolapse from this, they, um, they should be referred to us directly um, because these patients often will require more than just a, a repair of their prolapse. They, meet, they may need some of their remnant mesh removed um, and at the time of their repair, um, if their bladder is no longer working, then they may need their bladder taken out and an ileochondroid surgery at the same time. So yeah, these are complex patients. Now, I'm gonna just spend a little bit of time to talk about um, uh, advances in managing complex recurrent prolapse. Majority of these patients are in the setting of post-vaginal uh, or sacrocopopexy mesh removal. So these patients have have had mesh in the past. So if they've got a recurrent of their prolapse, um, they're not keen to have another mesh put in. Um, uh, and they are very careful with the decisions uh, whether they would want another prolapse repair because they've already suffered uh, harm from the last surgery. 
Um, so the literature tells us that 50% of patients that has had mesh removal, um, this is not slings, these are mesh that's put in for prolapse, uh, may develop recurrence. And internationally, um, centers do offer either a stage approach, meaning they may have uh, a mesh removal surgery first, and then followed by a prolapse repair at, at a stage two, or uh, patients are offered concurrent surgeries, meaning they get their mesh removed and a prolapse repair at the same time. So uh, Eva Fong and I also offer this to patients. Uh, sometimes we do staged approach and sometimes we do concurrent um, prolapse repair, and it is all quite individualized um, to each patient. Now, uh, the results internationally, that basically shows there's actually no difference whether you do it concurrently or in a staged fashion. Now, uh, Fascial sacral corpopexy. So what is fascial sacral corpopexy? So sacral corpopexy is the photo, the picture that we've shown before. Basically, generally speaking, traditionally, you, you put a piece of mesh, a Y mesh that, um, that uh, covers the front and the back wall of the vagina, and that is anchored to the tailbone. So fascial sacral corpopexy basically is not using mesh, but it is um, exactly the same technique, the same idea, um, but we take a piece of fascia um, from the patient. So generally speaking, um, Eva and I harvest the fascia lata, which is uh, from the side of the leg, of the thigh. Um, and generally we do this uh, robotically. Um, and we take up to about 14 centimeters by two centimeters. So it's, it's quite a, a, a big um, cut in the side of their thigh. And patients do uh, recover quite well, but they, they, they can get quite sore on that side for about six weeks. Patients that um, has an open approach, um, if the length between the top of the vagina and the sacrum isn't too lot, too far apart, um, we could do a rectal special harvest because you really have the, um, the, the, the open wound right there. But it does increase the risk of um, a hernia. Now, I'm just not going to spend too much time with this. Uh, tendon sacral corpopexy. Now, um, we have certainly harvest, harvested um, a gracilis tendon uh, with the help of a, um, a knee surgeon um, for a patient of ours who has a very, very complex um, uh, uh, history of uh, prolapse repair and recurrence and mesh pain and further recurrence after cyclical apexy. And we decided that we wanted something stronger and um, uh, for her and we, we've tried a gracilis tendon and so far, it is holding up, but these are these are techniques that that we have no long term results. So it is not something that we offer to everyone. Um, often these are patients that actually has no other choice. We can't use mesh. There are no other tissue, and we're really just trying to um, find the safest option for them. Now, for patients that has got quite a um, hostile abdomen, um, lots of adhesions or patients are too comorbid for us to go through uh, the abdomen. We've also offered uh, a facial augmented vagina repair where we do harvest the same facial lata from the side of their thigh and put it um, in the vagina and use that to um, uh, like an interposition and use that to uh, support the, the, the repair. And Again, the, the, we don't have long-term results for this. And often these are patients that really has got no other, other option. Now, I'm just gonna talk very, in a very, very uh, briefly about primary facial sacral corpexy because we, we have done this. And, um, but again, patients, these are patients that are appropriately consented um, who uh, basically says no to mesh and, um, and wants an abdominal approach. Uh, doesn't want a vaginal approach because of either they have vaginal pain issues. And um, again, we're left with um, uh, little options. So, so we have done primary facial sacral epoxy for patients. Again, these patients know that we don't have long-term results and we cannot guarantee the 90% long-term success rate as um, of uh, mesh sacral epoxy. So I think some, some, um... Just now, moving on to the post-operative, um, you know, uh, after prolapse repair, some general advice that we, we give to these patients. So again, there's no recipe or set rules for this. Um, 
in the literature you find great variation and no general consensus um, uh, around uh, advice for these patients, but ideally the advice needs to be tailored for each individual um, based on the type of surgery they've had, their preoperative activity levels, um, the surgeon's instructions, and, and ideally in conjunction with a pelvic health physiotherapy review. Um, however, I know this is often not achievable or realistic, so some general guidelines that could be applied. Um, initial focus is on, on ensuring they can empty their bladder and bowels properly. Um, they should be able to go to the toilet without too much issue, so this is really important in those early days. Um, so therefore, we come back to um, avoiding or managing constipation. Again, this is really a vital after prolapse repair surgery. Um, women really need to avoid that straining and pushing down um, on an area that's been repaired. So keeping an eye on this and managing it is very high on the priority list. Uh, we generally say avoid heavy lifting for four to six weeks. And I can hear you all asking, what's classed as heavy? So generally, I say to my patients, no lifting anything heavier than a full kettle for four weeks. So if they can comfortably lift it in one hand, they're fine um, at sort of that chest level. But if they need two hands, then it's too heavy. Uh, the only exception to this would be uh, lifting shopping bags from the ground. We, I know we use one hand for that, but we definitely don't want them lifting um, shopping bags. So also with lifting comes um, pushing, shoving and dragging. So you really want to avoid those activities that increase that intra-abdominal pressure. Um, after four to six weeks, they can gradually start increasing the weight they are lifting for their activity, activities of uh, daily living, you know, the things they're doing around the home. Um, uh, standing for long periods should also be avoided um, for four to six weeks. And I always give my patients the example that, you know, they can prepare a light snack, but they're not to stand in the kitchen for hours preparing a, you know, three course dinner party or anything like that or a big meal. Uh, pelvic floor muscle training. Now here, the focus, like I've said in the first few weeks, is on ensuring they can empty their bladder and bowels well and that they aren't in pain and that they're generally, you know, recovering and healing and returning to their normal daily activities and functions. So you don't really need to worry too much about specific pelvic floor muscle strengthening exercises in the first few weeks. Um, although once their catheter is out, they can do the odd contraction to help increase blood flow and enhance healing. And to just really remember where their muscles are and how to contract them. And, and often if they've had a big prolapse repaired, this will feel quite different to them. Um, but they don't really need to be doing any more than this at this stage. From around six weeks postoperatively onwards, um, and ideally after pelvic health physiotherapy review, um, a more intensive strengthening program can be started. Um, I think it's really important just here to note while we're talking about muscles, sometimes patients will present with pain postoperatively, and it can be from what we call overactive or sometimes called hypertonic pelvic floor muscles. And this is where their muscles don't relax properly and they're in a state of contraction or tension. And um, sometimes people with large prolapses have this anyways, they've got that feeling of trying to hold everything in, so they tense their muscles up all the time. Um, Look, it's really important that this is identified as their pain will usually get worse or at least not go away until this is managed. Um, and again, this is another reason why we don't recommend those gung-ho pelvic floor muscle strengthening in the first few weeks post-operatively. Um, as far as exercise goes, walking is generally your best exercise in the beginning and ideally on the flat. Um, adding in hills is a progression and best left later in their recovery. Um, sometimes cycling and swimming from around four to six weeks um, onwards is okay, but I definitely get the surgeons okay for this um, before they do this. Any higher impact activities, returning to sport and running is generally not recommended until around three months post-op. And again, it would be best for them to see a pelvic health physio for specific guidance on this. Um, they, you know, they have to return to things gradually um, and gently. Usually these patients will be off work for six weeks. They aren't allowed to drive for six weeks, um, but they can be driven around um, and no intercourse for six weeks. And then with regard to returning to intercourse, um, recommending a good lubricant is really helpful. 
Um, and also informing the patient that the first couple of times it might be a little uncomfortable, but it shouldn't really last longer than this. Um, and that painful intercourse postoperatively is not normal. Um, if it is, then um, review with a surgeon is, is usually needed. So yeah, like I said, return to activities and exercise should be slow, gradual and steady, um, and they should have no pelvic floor or prolapse symptoms and, and definitely no pain. Um, please note these are only general guidelines. Like I said earlier, um, advice really needs to be individualized for each patient depending on their surgery and what they want to get back to. Um, so these patients, I think, would all benefit from review by a pelvic health physio around six weeks post-op, um, if not pre-operatively as well. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'm acutely aware of time, but we do have a couple more things we wanted to cover. So I'll try and kind of skim through this a little bit. I did just want to talk a little bit about postpartum prolapse because this is something now with the ACC changes. Um, you may start seeing more women presenting with this and wanting referral through for assessment. So um, prolapse more than about a stage two is common. So maybe up to half of women in the first three to six months postpartum, so post vaginal birth. Um, and we know much higher rate with the vaginal birth um, with a forceps it's an odd ra odds ratio of 5.5 compared with a Caesar. Um, the mechanisms of birth injury to the pelvic floor, so direct perineal trauma, the damage to the, um, to the muscles um, externally, um, like lacerations um, to the vagina or to the perineal body. Um, and muscle trauma, particularly the levator muscles. So this diagram here quite nicely shows that that baby is a bit like a bowling ball, comes through, causes quite a bit of damage and really stretches those muscles. You can see how much those levator muscles are stretched up to kind of three or more times um, their normal length. Um, so it's no wonder that you do get quite a lot of damage to the pelvic floor. Levator avulsion, which we talked about earlier, where you lose one of the attachments um, to the pubic bone, one or both, um, happens in maybe up to 40% of women giving birth for their first, first child. Um, and that's an ultrasound diagnosis up to about nine months. In forceps, it might be even higher than that, maybe 60 to 70%. And you can also get kind of nerve injury, um, which can cause um, uh, problems as well. So in terms of recovery, um, there's not a lot of data. We know that dysfunction can affect your quality of life in the postpartum period. Um, the vaginal tissues and muscles do undergo tissue remodeling and healing for several months postpartum. And so in most women, their pelvic floor muscle function will recover in the year postpartum. Um, it, it may not fully recover, but it, it should recover to a significant degree. Um, we know that the lack of estrogen while breastfeeding um, may delay the return of function. Um, but there was one study that showed there was no uh, that there was no difference in recovery at three months um, postpartum for your breastfeeding compared to not. So in general, the recommendations, what I would recommend to women um, who have got symptomatic who have symptomatic products postpartum would be breastfeed as long as you want to. Um, don't stop breastfeeding just because of your prolapse. Breastfeeding is really important for a multitude of reasons. Um, there's no evidence of worse outcomes long term if you breastfeed compared to not breastfeeding. Um, I'd reassure them that there's going to be sustained improvement over 12 months and that they may have further improvement when they do stop breastfeeding, but that the vagina is going to be different. It's, it's going to be different to what, the way it was before you pushed a baby out. And often women really struggle to come to terms with that concept. There's not a lot that's talked about that antenatally. And so sometimes women really struggle with the fact that things aren't the same. Um, we've managed this conservatively. So pelvic health physio, um, for advice um, and strengthening pelvic floor muscle training, as well as considering pessaries. And the general rule would be to avoid surgery for at least 12 months postpartum and certainly wait until they've completed their family. A few exceptions to that rule, if they have had excessive um, scar tissue at the perineum and it's causing pain or pain with intercourse, we, we would revise that. Um, sometimes there can be kind of overzealous suturing, which means the introitus is not large enough for functional intercourse. Um, and so we would also then revise that. But for prolapse, um, we would generally be avoiding surgery. Um, the other thing is also, even if you had someone with a significant prolapse at a year postpartum, if they're lifting their one-year-old um, who weighs 13 kilos or whatever, um, or two-year-old 13 kilos, you know, that's going to be repetitive strain on the pelvic floor. So you really want to kind of wait until they're in a situation where they're not doing so much heavy lifting. Um, so we kind of mentioned this in our last webinar. So there's now ACC cover for maternal birth injuries, and this is from the 1st of October this year. So it's not retrospective, but anybody who's given birth from 1st of October moving forwards um, may receive some ACC cover um, for any of these injuries. And you can see the top one there is prolapse. 
Um, so um, any woman who is having symptomatic problems with prolapse, um, then it will be worthwhile looking at filing ACC claims and seeing if you can get some cover for them to maybe see a physiotherapist um, in the first instance. Um, so just in general, when we're talking about prolapse, uh, just an overview of management, there is always the option of doing nothing. And this is always a viable option unless there's some organ dysfunction. Lifestyle advice, Shelley covered. Um, using estrogen vaginal cream, we didn't cover this in too much detail. It's not going to fix the prolapse, but it may well make them feel more comfortable and treat some of the associated um, urinary urgency symptoms or just, you know, um, discomfort with intercourse. We talked about physiotherapy or pelvic floor exercises. Um, a pessary, and then the next last option is surgery, so either reconstructive or obliterative. Um, we just had a couple of cases, which I'll quite quickly get through. I just wanted to, do, to talk about, we kind of would, the whole theme of this was really just, do you reassure a woman or do you refer, and when do you do what? So I just wanted to go through a postpartum case. So a 32-year-old woman, two months following a vaginal birth, quite a big baby, um, symptomatic prolapse immediately postpartum with some incomplete bladder emptying and urinary urgency. Some improvement over the two months, but still quite uncomfortable um, with ongoing urgency. Breastfeeding, um, not yet sexually active and really embarrassed about what things look like, which is, we see this all the time, particularly in young women. They're really embarrassed. They've had a look with a the mirror. They think it looks awful. Um, they're really worried about having intercourse and what their partner will think. So on examination, this woman had a stage two anterior prolapse, so coming to the hymen, with uterine descent to about the mid-vagina, but a well-heeled perineum but uncomfortable with the examination and had quite atrophic vaginal tissues from breastfeeding. So in this scenario, we would reassure. Um, so, and this would be something that you could do in primary care. So reassure this woman that she is likely to get improvement with time. Um, prescribe estrogen cream because this is going to help with her discomfort in the vagina and help with comfort with intercourse. Um, it would be worthwhile um, in this situation also referring for a physiotherapist um, or a continent specialist. In this situation, if she's given birth since the 1st of October, she may qualify for some ACC cover. And in this situation, I would probably only look at referring through to a specialist, so a gynecologist or a urogynecologist, if the woman's interested in trialing a pessary and it's not something that you or the physiotherapist or continent nurse specialist um, can provide in the community. So in this situation, she saw a physio privately, continued to make improvements. And at 12 months postpartum, she'd had significant improvements in her symptoms. Um, her bladder function had normalized. She still had a prolapse on examination um, uh, to one centimeter within the introitus. So still actually what we call a stage two, but it's now within the within the introitus, so above the hymen, um, and well estrogenized tissues. And using a pessary intermittently when she's on her fetal day. So when she knows she's going to be really busy, she found that she gets comfort from that. The other thing that we often would talk about is in this situation, generally the damage is done with your first baby. Um, and so there's, uh, you should just, the, these women should be uh, fine to have vaginal births for future deliveries. The only exception to that is if they've had an anal sphincter injury, in which case we would sometimes give different advice about elective cesarean section to protect their fu anal function. But in this situation with prolapse, we would recommend um, there's no indication for a cesarean section to protect her pelvic floor. Um, and just very quickly, um, Recurrent prolapse in a 69-year-old woman. So I've got two women here, basically same story. They've both had a vaginal hysterectomy and vaginal repair, so native tissue, age 55, and they've both got a prolapse um, of the top of the vagina and the front wall coming to one centimeter beyond the hymen. But for Valerie on the left, this was just an incidental finding when she had a smear. She's not bothered by the bulge. She has some mild vaginal discomfort and constipation. This is a woman to reassure. Estrogen cream will help with some of that discomfort. She's postmenopausal, so she may well have a degree of atrophic change in the vagina. Manage her constipation and consider referring through to a physiotherapist um, uh, for advice. Particularly, I mean, if you are happy to assess pelvic floor muscle strength and you and feel that she's got good strength, then she may well do fine just on her own. Um, but as Shelley said, often women do get um, better improvement with time, particularly if they're not sure what to do, then seeing a physiotherapist in this situation may well be useful. As opposed to Mary, who's got the same story, same findings on examination, but she's really bothered by this bulge. She's got some difficulties passing urine. She can't have intercourse because that bulge just gets in the way. This is someone to refer. So this is someone to refer um, to a physiotherapist and a specialist. Um, her symptoms, are un they are likely to improve a bit with, with physiotherapy, but th this degree of symptoms, she's likely to need some further assistance, either with a pessary or with surgery. Um, so referring through for assessment is useful, as well as providing some estrogen cream. Uh, Samson? Thank you. Now, um, when you come to, uh, I'm just going to have 
discuss one case. So um, this is a lady, she's uh, 44. She's had um, uh, a native tissue repair before. She has uh, two vaginal mesh uh, placed for uh, prolapse. So she's got a perigee and an uphold and she's had um, at least two um, trimmings for exposure. Um, when she came to see me, she had um, no pain, um, no recurrence of a prolapse, and just, just further exposure of the mesh in the vagina. Um, we went through having a 3D ultrasound. Um, this was to look at if there were any other threatened areas. So we tried not to um, put people through multiple trimmings, you know, multiple excisions of exposure. So I generally do a 3D ultrasound to look at all the possible areas that are going to expose if they are very thin over a piece of mesh. So this lady has, um, they went through a wide local excision uh, of the mesh and, um, and had a, a flap to close the anterior vaginal wall. Uh, everything had healed very well. She had a very good outcome for about nine months. And following that, um, she then developed this heaviness in the vagina and then um, new dyspareunia um, and also recurrent urinary tract infection. Um, and there was a suspicion that she may have a recurrence of the prolapse because we've taken a lot of the anterior mesh out and she's lost a lot of support. Um, surprisingly, on examination, uh, there was no recurrence of her prolapse. Um, however, on the side of the anterior vaginal wall, um, there was a, a thickened uh, tissue whether it is actually the edge of the mesh arms, uh, whether it's actually scar from the previous surgery, or whether they are just remnant mesh um, that was left, um, it was actually symmetrical, um, the right and the left, in terms of um, findings on palpation. The interesting thing was the, uh, it was tender um, on the left side, but not on the right. Um, so she has tenderness all along the left uh, pelvic floor muscles, as well as the left uh, obturated internus muscle, but um, quite comfortable, quite soft on the right-hand side. And the left side on examination was like a guitar string, it was really that tight. So this lady, um, I have advice for pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy and, um, and uh, trigger point massage to try and release those uh, tender points and also reassuring her that she does not have a recurrence of a prolapse. And, um, and we're going to see if this would settle down with her. Um, the difficulty would be if this doesn't settle her pain, what would be our next step? Um, I'm thinking along the lines whether we would trial a, um, some steroid injections, some local anesthetic injection to see if that would help with those pains. Um, the worst case scenario would be to excise those areas. Now, um, so take home message for this case is when, they, when patients has that mesh re re removal or excision, it doesn't always mean that they will have a recurrence. And if they've got pain, we've got to identify where the pain is coming from and try and treat it locally if we can. Now, I thought that we um, had a good feedback from the last um, talk about incontinence about this 15 minute consult. So I thought you've got limited time in your consult. So I thought this will be the uh, really important points to um, to uh, pick up in your um, short time with your patient. So again, uh, if the patient has a bulge, is it symptomatic or asymptomatic? Are there any red flags? If they are, refer early and um, go through the, the, the severity of the bothersome symptoms, bladder, vaginal, and bowel. And note if they have any pain syndromes. Do they have pelvic pain, abdominal pain, lower back pain? Um, if uh, to know if they're simple or complex, do they have previous mesh surgery? Do they have previous pelvic um, radiation? If they have any of those, they are complex, they, pro they would probably need early referral. And when you're examining this patient, um, you can easily look at whether they've got, um, their, how bad is their prolapse, you know, the maximal descent, the leading edge of that um, in relation to the hymen and just dot down how many centimeters in relation to that. Um, for management, um, uh, in sudden more investing the, the vaginal estrogen uh, treatment. Um, if you are used to putting pessaries in, um, you could put a pessary in for a trial and talk to them about lifestyle changes. And I strongly recommend that you uh, send them to a physiotherapist. Now, take home messages. I know this has been quite repetitive for you, um, but basically patients that is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, or I have symptoms that has um, prolapse that's above the hymen, not causing too much bother, reassure them. Uh, you can give them estrogen, you can change their lifestyle. And for those that are, that are um, 
would like, uh, they're more, they're more uh, um, involved in looking after themselves, they, you can certainly send them to, to a public health physiotherapist to maintain that or, you know, some like, like what Nikki was saying, some, some products may regress, they may have improvement, like what um, Shelley has mentioned. Those that requires early referral um, are the ones that has bothersome symptom, bothersome bulge, and also products that's beyond uh, the hymen. I would strongly recommend that you send them to people like Shelley early um, and also refer to us because often uh, there's a bit of a wait before they see us. But patients that has red flags, please, please write it on your um, referral so that we can see them sooner rather than later. And um, for patients that has not improved with uh, supervised intensive physiotherapy after three to six months, do refer them on for us because most of them will probably require surgery. Now, it's important to reassure your patients because of the anxiety around um, mesh repair, vaginal repair, slings, um, that um, seeing a surgeon does not always uh, does not equal to surgery or mesh. These are some useful resources. Um, the Health Navigator link, um, which I've had a look yesterday myself, they've got really good information uh, that you can um, have a look. And um, I think you're probably already familiar with your local health pathways um, to get your referrals through to us. And um, the Physiotherapy and website is also a good resource. And also the pictures that we've shown today, are, uh, they're mainly taken from the uh, yourpelvicfloor.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, Samson and Shelley. What an amazing um, presentation and lots of really practical tips, um, I think, from all different aspects of care. Um, and I know we've gone quite quite a bit over time. I, I'm just going to put two questions live. Um, and I know the team have been amazing at starting to answer some of them um, online and typing in answers. But these two I'd like to ask, um, and maybe the first one to you, Nikki, which is around, there seems to be some overlap between surgeons and gynecologists re regarding obstructive def defecation as a symptom. And I have a patient who seems to be being bounced between the two specialties. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on the overlap and how a referring GP can, can make sure we get it right, make sure we're referring to the right specialty? So for me, if I see a patient with obstructive defecation and they have a significant um, posterior vaginal wall prolapse, um, that tells me that if we straighten that wall um, vaginally, it may well improve their symptoms, but I can't promise that that's the case because sometimes there can be something else going on within their rectum. They may have intersusception or something else going on. But for the most part, um, women would often get a significant improvement in their symptoms from obstructive defecation if we repair that large you know, posterior prolapse. And sometimes we see this woman and it's huge and it kind of fills the vagina and it comes to one or two centimeters out of the vagina. And we know that if we do a really good repair and a really good perineal repair and provide good support, that's highly likely to give them an improvement in symptoms. But as I said, it doesn't always. And so we always have to be careful to say, look, there could be something else going on, but we will definitely get rid of that bulge. And then we would hope that those symptoms will improve. And if they don't, then we'd look at referring them through to the colorectal service. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and the second question, I'm just going to mash two together so we get a get an answer, um, which is around the second pregnancy. So if you've uh, either had a traumatic first birth or a bothersome prolapse after the first birth um, during the second pregnancy, are they more at risk of advancing a prolapse? And um, how, do they have a recommendation around how they uh, approach their delivery that second time around? Yeah, so if a woman has a prolapse after her first delivery, um, Sometimes that will get worse in pregnancy and certainly early pregnancy, things will start to drop down as the uterus expands and starts to lift the lift up into the pelvis. Sometimes things aren't quite so bad, but then later in pregnancy, it can again drop down. And we would often manage this with a pessary in pregnancy. So that can be a really useful way of managing symptoms during pregnancy um, if they're really uncomfortable. In terms of delivery, as I kind of said, you know, if someone has a significant prolapse after their first delivery, they're highly likely to have levator avulsion. The damage is done. You know, a second baby, um, if the damage is done already, the second baby is not going to do a huge amount more. Um, and so that in itself is not an indication for cesarean section. Mm -hmm. However, we also have to be really cognizant that some women are extremely traumatized um, from delivery psychologically. And we kind of have to take that into consideration as well, um, particularly if they'd had maybe a traumatic shoulder dystocia or there'd been a whole lot of other things going on at that time. And that's something that we do need to kind of consider. Bearing in mind um, resource limitations also um, in terms of we do need kind of good reasons to do cesarean sections. 
So yeah, so we have to be, it's it's one of those things that certainly if a woman had prolapse in pregnancy, she needs to see someone, an obstetrician or a gynecologist or urogynecologist. Um, and then we can also have a discussion about what's going to be best for them to in terms of delivery and how to manage it postpartum. And because things will get worse postpartum as well, again, after that second delivery. And they may well need to keep using that pessary for, for some time. In conjunction with a very good pelvic health physiotherapist or continence nurse specialist <laughs> who will provide excellent advice. <laughs> For worth their weight in gold, as Very we know. So. And thank you for all your wisdom, Shelley, around that. And you too, Nikki and Samson. We really appreciate all your help tonight in um, amazing teaching. And someone has asked if all the links and resources are going to be put up. So we'll put them up on our web page. And obviously the recording of this webinar will be available for people to review again in a couple of days' time. So thank you again for coming along and sharing all your information with us, guys. And um, good night. <laughs>